Welcome to episode 78 of the Autism Outreach Podcast. I'm your host, Rose Griffin, and you are in for a treat today. We are mixing it up here on the podcast, and what I have for you today is one of our most listened to webinars. It is titled Five Autism Strategies for Toddlers and Preschool Age Students. So if you are working with students who are in that early intervention range, you are going to love this webinar. I talk all about my top five strategies for what you should do in therapy sessions. So whether you are a speech therapist and you have students where therapy, where to start, what to do during the session feels a little overwhelming because your students are having trouble engaging or your own child has autism and you're on a wait list and you are just waiting to get started in the home environment with strategies or you're a behavioral professional and you are helping support little ones. This is going to give you an amazing starting point. I hope that you enjoy this webinar, Five Autism Strategies for Toddlers and Preschool Age Students. Let's dig on in. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Welcome. I'm super excited that you are here today to talk about five autism strategies for toddlers and preschool age students. If you're new to me, my name is Rose Griffin, and I am a speech-language pathologist and board-certified behavior analyst. I am the founder of ABA Speech, and my mission is to help all autistic students become independent communicators. The fact that you're here is amazing, and I can't wait to share with you today. I'm going to show you how you can help your students start communicating. For attending live today, I'm going to share a guide with you that will allow you to take notes about the things that we are talking about today. I'm also going to share with you a handout of my slides so that you can reference this information. I know that sometimes when I'm attending a talk, I like to go back afterwards and think about what was said, how it applies to my caseload or my own child. And uh, I love being able to provide that for you today. You are in the right place if you are working with autistic toddlers or preschool age students. We are going to be talking about working with younger students today. This is Angie. Angie is a customer of ABA Speech. She has taken some of our autism courses. And if you are like Angie and you are a speech language pathologist, you are in the right spot. If you are like Michelle and are a mom to an autistic child, you are in the right spot. You are also in the right spot if you are a special education professional. What is the biggest challenge that you face? Is it difficult to engage students? Are you not sure where to start? Does it feel like a mystery with where to start and supporting your students? Or are your students just not communicating? I do a survey for my email list, and you might be a part of that every quarter, four times a year. And these are some of the biggest challenges that my audience is facing. And I'm excited to share information with you today that no matter what you chose for one, two, or three is going to help you. Sometimes that idea of knowing where to start with communication can be so very stressful. 
Oftentimes what happens, especially with our younger learners, it may be hard for them to engage in a standardized assessment and engage with those types of activities. So that if we don't have a really robust assessment, we may feel unsure with how to goal set for our students. We may not know where to start in therapy. It almost feels like a mystery. It's overwhelming and we're just not sure what that first step is. I am here to help you today. If you're new to me, I am a speech therapist and I divide my time between a public school as a public school speech therapist. And also I have my own private practice called ABA Speech. I am beyond proud to say that ABA Speech is an ASHA approved CE provider and we provide autism courses and other courses with our mission of helping all autistic learners that are ASHA approved. Our most popular are Start Communicating Today for toddlers and preschool age students and Help Me Find My Voice, which is our school age course. In addition to that, we have therapy products that we've created, action builder cards that help with expressive and receptive language and the double up life skills game. Recently, this past year, I launched my own podcast, which has been an amazing, awesome experience called Autism Outreach. It is a weekly podcast. A new episode drops every Tuesday, and it's all about autism and communication. So on the podcast, I have on autistic individuals, speech therapists, families who have an autistic individual or child within their family, BCBAs, you name it. We've had them on. It's an amazing show. So make sure you tune in if you haven't heard that. When I am not doing presentations, trainings, consults, you name it, I am spending time with my family. They are away at school right now and work. So it should be quiet for our training today. Um, and I am running around with them to all their activities, which I love and adore. Can you imagine a stress-free session with your autistic students where they are engaged, spontaneously communicating, and having fun? Using these five strategies that I'm going to talk about today will help your students start communicating. Let's get right into the strategies. Strategy number one is to create a fun atmosphere. We want to present a toy that the child may enjoy. Maybe our child likes baby Yoda. I mean, who doesn't, right? Maybe we present something that we think they will like. This guy like kind of bounces around, super fun. We want to play with a toy and use simple language. Simple language. So if our student loves Play-Doh, or we think they might enjoy that, we're going to have some Play-Doh out and available. Now with COVID and kind of any time before, I never really liked to share Play-Doh. It definitely was not something that I thought was fun for my students. And I just... Uh, wanted to make sure that every student would have their own Play-Doh container. Super, super important now, especially with the pandemic. So I have therapy bags for all my private clients and inside is their own special Play-Doh. So if we have the Play-Doh when we're playing with the student, we can say, oh, I have Play-Doh. I'm making a snake. I'm making a cookie. I have a pizza. Yummy, yummy. We want to use that simple language. We might have a racetrack or a car toy. These are very, very fun. We could say, wow, I have a car. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to go down the ramp. Wee! Or vroom, vroom. We want to make sure that we're not bombarding our student with a lot of questions. We want to just have these things available. They could be things our student likes. We're not sure yet, but we want to have these items available and we want to use simple language and we don't want to bombard with a bunch of questions. 
Music toys. My students love music toys. I know that I have uh, music toys like this and other toys that they can play like a drum. Um, I know when my uh, my own kids have the drum, I'm kind of like, okay, that's enough. That's a lot of drumming. But they are very fun for therapy because you kind of get that sensory input of uh, playing the music and you hear it. And it can be really, really a fun thing for the students. I love mini objects. Mini objects. This is a uh, colleague of mine. She has a company called Speech Tree Co. And she sells mini objects and a bunch of cool stuff. But I love... And she's allowing me to use this picture, but I love mini objects. Mini objects, um, you could get them from her company. You could get them on Amazon, um, a lot of different places, five below. Mini objects have a really cool quality and that they're different, right? They have, as you can see here in this picture, there's a lot of different things to look at and they're fun to play with. They are very, very fun. When I bring mini objects, into sessions, I'm having fun, my students having fun. Um, it can definitely be a cool thing to have in your therapy bag. And when you're working with little ones, you want to have things that your, your kids are going to really enjoy and be engaged with. Can you see how this would be a great start to your session to have something really, really fun to kick it off, to set the tone, to set the vibe, to say this is going to be fun. Today, I went to see uh, one of my private clients and I hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks because he was not feeling the greatest. And I had brought some mini objects, mini little chairs and little mini farm animals. And that's how we started our session. And it was so cool to see him pick up the objects. He's at a point where he is now saying some single words and he was able to talk about some of these things and really hearing his voice in that spontaneous language at the start of a session uh, was really, really cool. Okay, on to strategy number two. Strategy number two is to observe. What does the student like to do? What do your students like to do? If I was able to sit with you and we were able to have a chat, I talk with a lot of you through email, my Instagram DMs, uh, messages, and things like that. But if I was able to talk with you today live, I would say, you know, what does your stu student really love to do? I love when I am able to talk with you and hear about all the things your students like. And how is your student currently communicating? This is going to be really good information. Thinking about what your student likes to do, we really need to focus on this idea of connection before communication. Building a therapeutic rapport is what I say with my students. It's so very important that we really take that time to understand what they love. I had a student who I saw in a non-public program, and he was so limited in what he seemed to enjoy that it was hard for me. I worked with him for a very long time, and it was just hard because he didn't seem to like any of the items that I presented. Um, I was able to find out that he, uh, you know, he really liked music, and that was really kind of eye opening uh, for us and really helped us. I had another student who seemed very limited in what they enjoyed, but we found out that he really loved jumping on a trampoline, and so we would incorporate that into sessions. If you need some ideas on what your students might enjoy, I have this preference assessment, potential reinforcer profile that a colleague of mine had developed. And I am going to share it with you um, today. It is my gift to you. So it's really nice. I like to print it out, look at it. I don't send it home. I just try some of these different things in therapy to see if my students are enjoying it. And I, and I make notes about that. So thinking about how is your child currently communicating? Okay, we thought about what do they love and enjoy? What really gets them going? And what's so unique about that is that it's going to be individualized for every student that you have. Um, and talking about now, how are they currently communicating? Are they talking some with their voice? 
are they able to point to some things that they want? Um, I have a student that I see in the home and I was over the other day and he got up from his therapy session in the living room and he walked to the kitchen. Um, he's autistic. He, he's limited verbally, starting to say some words. And he wanted something in the pantry, opens the door. He brings his mom over. He's pointing. Um, she brings it down and he wanted a donut, which I thought, hey, hey, bud, who doesn't want a donut? But I thought it was great. And it was nice for me to be able to observe uh, that moment, because in that moment, I'm able to see how is my client currently communicating, right? I love this picture with the clip art and the hat. We always are detectives with our clients. So it was great for me to see because the student was pulling his mom over. He was pointing to something. Um, and then when she brought it down and she said, don't it, he was able to say, don't it after that uh, model. So asking yourself, is your student talking? Is your student pointing? Is your student pulling you or parents to an item? Are they vocalizing? Because not every student is going to be vocalizing, especially when they're younger learners that we're talking about today. Are they using sign language? Some parents and some um, daycare providers, you know, they teach baby sign. And so some students might have a handle on some signs that they're using. I use baby sign. My, I have three kids of my own. They're all typical language learners, but we use sign language in my home for things that my kids really wanted. So they didn't feel, you know, so they didn't feel overwhelmed or cry because they couldn't get what they wanted and they couldn't communicate it because that's frustrating and that's hard for, for all kids. Are they using pictures? Or are they using a total communication approach with maybe they're using more than one form of communication to get their needs and wants met across their day? Can you see how this would be a great starting point? We're going to get to know our students. We're going to build that therapeutic rapport. And we're going to take note of where they are with communication right now. All right, on to strategy number three. Strategy number three is to engage in shared activities. Boy, this is an important one. If you are multitasking, come back to me. This is an important part of the talk. Communication is so powerful. And we know that oftentimes... Speaking from a provider sense, you know, parents can be very, very worried that their child is not talking yet. And we know as therapists that we need to work on shared activities so that we can build that connection before a child is going to start verbalizing. And so we in the field of speech pathology may talk about these terms using the words joint attention. And what this means, it's an activity where I'm in the activity as the speech therapist and the student is in the activity as well. And we are doing this activity together as a shared activity. I do a lot of parent training and working a lot with parents, especially the students that I see in their home. And so instead of using words like joint attention, sometimes I just say shared activity. One of those shared activities is reading a book. And Chicka Chicka Boom Boom is one of my very favorite books to use with early learners who are toddlers or preschool age. Chicka Chicka Boom Boom is a really nice book because it has this phrase over and over again repetitively in the book. So Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. If your students are verbalizing a little bit, they could imitate those words. Also, when you open the book up, it has the alphabet, A through Z. So oftentimes what I do when I am reading this book in a session is that I will start by singing the alphabet. And a lot of my students really like that. So this is a shared activity because it's literacy-based. We're doing it together. And you can incorporate music, which is so important for our itty-bitties. So I may start A, B, C, D, E, F. Sometimes kids like to try to put an approximated sound in there. Or some of my students who are not 
using language functionally yet in their environment, they might know some of those letters and they might enjoy that. And so if you haven't heard of Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, this is a great book for shared activities. Another book that's one of my favorites for shared activities is Pete the Cat. Pete the Cat is walking in his white shoes. And there's a song that goes along with this. Now you can read it just like you would read a book and use kind of an animated voice. That's what I do. Um, But you can also sing. I love my white shoes. I love my white shoes. And then Pete gets into all these different situations where he's stepping in different things. And then we say, Oh, no. Pete stepped in a large pile of strawberries. And there's just a lot of opportunities for kids to be excited. I think something that's important too is, you know, when I first started doing some of these shared activities with one of my home clients, you know, the parents were very, um, they wanted the student to sit. They wanted the student to sit and attend to the book. And, you know, I said, no, that's okay. We're not going to, we can't make our students engage. We want to create an environment where our students are going to be excited about the activity. So the first time I read this book with one of my early learners, I started reading the book and he was excited. He had never seen it before. And then after about 30 seconds, he got up and he left the teaching area and he just went to a different part of the room, which was fine. And I told the parents, don't worry about it. It's okay. I'm going to keep reading my book. I'm going to show the pictures. I'm going to try to re-engage him with how exciting this activity is. And over time, he would sit for longer durations of time. Not because I said, okay, time for a book. We need to sit now. I did not say that. I did not say that at all. I said, okay, we're going to read Pete the Cat. Remember Pete? And we would do it together. And I would just note those things on my data sheet. Singing a song is another amazing way to engage in a shared activity. So this is for Itsy Bitsy Spider, right? That's a very, very fun song. There are a lot of different songs that we can use with our students. The Wheels on the Bus is another song that I love. The wheels on the bus go round and round. I love the wheels on the bus because there's motions. I just made an Instagram reel, which is a short form video about singing this song. You know, the wipers on the bus go swish, 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 swish. Um, And I could go on and on, but I will spare you because I did not have a good singing voice, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect for our kids. It's all about that shared activity. I love being able to use music in my sessions two. Um, I had a student who I was going into the home to see the student and we were doing wheels on the bus. First time I did it, I presented it. Um, He really was not that engaged and that's okay. We sang the song. I kind of noted that on the data sheet. And then I came the next time and I had a mini object that was a bus. And that was just next level. He was so excited. He had the bus. He even said the word bus. The third time that I presented that song, the third week that I I did the song, he started doing some of the motions for the wipers and also for the baby. The baby on the bus goes, he thought that was hilarious. And so it took until the third presentation of that song for him to start doing the motions. He was there with me. We were engaged. He stayed in the area and he wanted to hear what I was doing, but it took the third session until he started doing some of the motions and that's okay. Playing with toys. Playing with toys is another amazing way that we can work in a shared activity. So this was, I had this whole Um, ice cream theme (laughs) ready to go earlier this summer with a student. Um, This is in my home office. You can see same harp action builder double up um, background there. And I had this whole book about uh, ice cream and then we were going to do an ice cream activity. And then I, we were going to feed the baby's ice cream. So uh, that thing on top of the baby's head is actually ice cream, but my student thought it was a hat. And so I had a baby and I had the ice cream and he had the same. And I was like, oh, look, my baby's hungry. I'm going to give my baby ice cream uh, to work on some imitation skills. And what he did is he put that little ice cream on top of the baby's head and he said, hat. And I thought, 
Well, who am I to argue about that? I mean, this is the cutest thing ever. And yeah, it looks like a hat. I actually put that on my uh, social media and people said, I think your student's right. That totally looks like a hat. (laughs) The farm toy. I'll tell you what, if you don't have a farm toy, that is a good investment. Something that you can usually pick up at a mommy swap or a um, Goodwill thrift store garage sale, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be in pristine shape. Uh, This particular farm, one of my neighbors was getting rid of and she uh, donated it to ABA Speech. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Beth, for that. Um, This playing with toys is a great way to work on joint attention. I had brought this farm toy to a student's house and I had this whole idea about how we were going to play together and it was going to be a great way to work on a shared activity. And we were going to take all the farm animals and we're going to walk them into the farm and they were going to get all cozy in the barn. And my student did not want to do that. He wanted to take those farm animals right out of the barn. And I thought, okay, I'm going to pivot here. I'm going to remain flexible, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we walked the animals out of the barn and we did that together. And we did that activity for about 10 minutes and it was so fun and it was very engaging and we were doing it together. So those are so important. Those ways of thinking about connection before communication to build that solid foundation for our students is something that we have to focus on. Okay, we made it. Strategy number four is to create a positive atmosphere. Positive vibes only. We want to make sure that we do this by using simple language. So if we have an airplane toy, we could say things like, I see an airplane. This is my pretend airplane. I can fly it. It goes up, up, up. We want to think about using simple language. And we do not, I repeat, do not want to bombard our students with questions. When we bombard our students with questions, especially toddlers and preschool age students who are autistic, who are not yet communicating, we are not gonna have a positive session. Our students may be very overwhelmed because they don't have the language at this time to say the answer to the question. (laughs) They don't maybe have the language to say, Uh, please stop asking me these questions. And so we want to make sure that we set that positive tone by using simplistic language and do not bombard students with questions. Do this, not that. Let's say that we have a truck or I go into a student's house and I see a truck. I could say, wow, I see a truck. I would not say, what is that? especially if our student's not yet communicating. They may not have the language for that. That may be really hard. And I definitely am not going to say what color. Let's say that I have a teddy bear. I could say, wow, it's a teddy bear. Simple language, positive, upbeat tone. I would not say, what is that? Or do you have one at home? Answering yes, no questions. I wish I would have known when I started in the field, that that's an extremely high level language skill. One year I was working in an autism program within a public school. It was the coolest program. And I had a bright idea to give a lot of my students a yes, no goal. Yes, no. Like, do you want this? Yes, no. Like, is this an apple? Is this baby Yoda? And I really learned the hard way that that is a higher level language skill. So remember, keep it simple. Use sentences. Okay, so it's important to have that positive tone, which may seem like a silly one to talk about. But I know if you're working with a student and you're in the home environment, or maybe you're in a school and you're seeing them in a group or you're seeing them on their own, and they're not communicating, they're not engaged in the lesson, it can feel very uh, flus- you can feel flustered. You feel overwhelmed. Um, is we want to just kind of take that step back and think about how can we keep things positive. All right, on to strategy number five, which this is just a good life strategy in general. 
for students of all ages, but especially with our little ones, is to remain flexible. Be flexible. So what might this look like? Some of these I alluded to a little bit before. Playing with the farm. Okay. We have the farm toy. We have the farm animals. We got the cow. We got the pig. The sheep is there. What you planned, because we all have a plan, right? Whether we're structured and we're writing it all down or we have a plan up here, we have a plan. You plan to walk the animals into the barn. Do, 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 do. And what actually happens is you walk the animals out of the barn. And I've been working with a student before in the home and something like this happened where we had planned it this, I had planned we were going to work on it this way, but I see the student wanting to do it a different way. And then I remain flexible and I kind of pivot on how we're going to work on the skill. And we still work on the skill, right? This is a shared activity. We're, we're working on nonverbal imitation, great foundational skills for little ones. And I explained that to the parent after we had done the activity and I was talking with the parent debriefing after the session. This is a client that I see through my private practice. And the parent said, well, how did you know to do that? And I said, I just, it's a lot of practice, right? Working with your kids and being immersed in therapy like this, you learn, um, you learn and you grow. And this training is definitely a step in the right direction. Let's say you're singing wheels on the bus and you start singing the singing, the song with the student and, and you want to do all the motions. You're like, we're going to work on imitation and this is what it's going to look like. And what actually happens? You start singing. The child stays with you for 30 seconds. They leave the teaching area and then they come back and they do some of the motions and that's okay. They don't have to physically be sitting. They don't have to physically be right there. They will come back to you. And you note that on your data sheet. Keep documentation of that. We have to remember to have a plan. It is important to have a plan. Doesn't mean it's going to go as planned because come on, we're working in with toddlers and preschool age students, but we have to have a plan. We want to be focused on the child. I think that's something that's so important. The longer that I do this, um, and I feel like as a therapist, there's so many barriers to the actual therapy. Um, you're thinking about an IEP goal. You're thinking about a meeting you got next. You're thinking about, you know, maybe a situation that is beyond your control where you're having to do something extra. Um, there's so many things, right? But I always try to be really present in the moment. And I think that's something we all have to try to work on. We follow the child's lead. If my kid that one day didn't want to walk the animals in the barn and I said, nope, that's what we're doing. Walk it in the barn. We're going in. We're not going out. We're going in. If I would have done that, I would have really ruined the relationship with the student. <clears throat> I was not being flexible if I would have done that. And I would have lost a teachable moment. I was flexible. Just like the last one says, I remain flexible. I put my thinking cap on and I thought, okay, I want to work on imitation skills. How can we do that? I'm going to follow the child's lead. He wants to walk those animals out of the barn. Here they go. They're just going. And that's okay because I was still able to work on the skill with the student's individual needs at the time and wants and what he wanted to do. Are you feeling a sense of relief knowing that you don't have to feel stuck, that you have a starting point? with your students. That starting point is no longer a mystery. These five strategies will allow you to get started in therapy with your autistic students. And let me tell you, these are great first steps towards communication. Do you want to learn more foundational skills that will help your students? Do you want to learn how to help each and every one of your autistic students increase their communication skills and maybe start talking for the first time? Do you want to learn how to write killer IEP goals? Because goal setting can be tough. Are you ready to take action? I want to invite you to join me and others inside Start Communicating Today. 
This is our ASHA approved toddler and preschool course. I just adore this graphic that we created for the course because it just embodies the joy that I feel about this offering. This is from Bridget, who has already taken the course. And she said, I am a school-based SLP in a rural area and have three pre preschoolers recently diagnosed with autism. The class has been very beneficial in helping me write goals, plan my therapy, and feel more confident that I'm making a difference with these kiddos. I appreciate that I'm able to get this training without having to travel or miss school because you can take it at your leisure. Thank you, Bridget, for sharing. What you will experience inside the course is how to work with students who are not speaking so they can start communicating, how to plan therapy so that your students have increased engagement in communication, how to feel confident, just like Bridget said, in writing these IEP goals so they're functional for your students, and you'll feel ready to plan amazing sessions for your students so they are engaged, learning, and making progress. In module one, we talk about autism assessment so that you understand where to start in therapy. I include principles with each module, but in this module, we have the coolest informal screener that I have developed and I use clinically weekly in my sessions. It is an amazing resource. So if you have students and you've tried to give them a standardized assessment and they did not engage in those tasks... This informal screener will give you an idea of where to get started with your goal setting. In module two, we talk about goal development so that you feel confident setting goals for your students. I include a very, very detailed goal bank that will help you thinking about how you can goal set for your students. In module three, we have materials. So I talk to people a lot and oftentimes they say, you know, Rose, what do I need to get started? Um, you know, I do some speech therapy assistance supervising, and um, it's for a place that has many locations. And so it's been really fun to be able to help them plan what materials they need for their speech uh, department. And that's really such a joy. And so I get asked that question a lot. And so I did a whole module on what materials are helpful when you're getting started with uh, younger students. And I have a printable guide in there, too, um, for how you can get started with these things. In module four, we talk about getting started with communication. This is our largest module. It's broken down into manageable chunks that you can watch um, in your leisure. And so we talk about, you know, understanding what are the foundational skills to address. I talk about those specific foundational skills, and then I talk about how you can address them. We have tutorials included in this module, how it looks in my therapy sessions. Um, and it's just, it's a wealth of information. There's a lesson planning guide and play and literacy guides too. And so really great for you to use if you're a professional and also if you are taking the course as a parent. In module five, we talk about group skills so that you feel confident with small group therapy for your students. There are adapted books included too. Um, I have a really wonderful student who uh, started taking the course the first time it was offered. She is a new speech therapist and she is working um, with small groups of students. And she has come into um, the community and asked me a lot of great questions um, about how to implement this with group skills. And so we have really fun activities and it's been really cool to hear how she's using these with her students. Um, and that is just such a joy to hear. Module six, I talk about parent and team training. So that you have a solid way to connect with parents and other team members. Because when we're working with younger students, we really need those parents as partners. Um, teachers, outside speech therapists, if there's a BCBA involved, there might be a lot of people at the table. How can we talk with these people together and get a good framework for that so we're all on the same page? Doesn't mean we have to do things the exactly the same way because that's not what I'm saying at all, but we want to feel collaborative and we want to have a way to train. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. Great information there. In module seven, we talk about data collection. So you have an effective way to collect data that is going to give you meaningful data that's going to help you analyze your data for future treatment decisions, um, but is not going to get in the way of your therapy sessions. 
Elizabeth H. said, this course has been beyond helpful. Um, she started it in September and she has a caseload of zero to three-year-olds with autism, without autism, and some who have suspected autism. Um, she said, I've been very lost on how to provide treatment, but the course has been a guide. I'm very grateful. So happy that she is in our community. So module one, module two, three, four, five, six, seven, this all has a value of $697. But for attending today, your investment is just $297. You also get some bonuses that I can't wait to share with you. So bonus one is you get invited to a private Facebook group community that is exclusive to students taking autism courses through ABA speech. And you get access to the course and the community for three months. And that has a value of $197. Bonus number two is I provide you with three months of group coaching. So I go into the private Facebook group. I post in there almost daily. People post questions, um, share information. And I also do a Facebook Live, um, which if you can't attend live, that's okay. It stays on in the group. Um, and I provide coaching. So I answer questions and yield um, information and talk about things that are helpful for the group. And you get access to that for three months as well. And that's a value of $885. Bonus three is principles. These principles, there are principles with each module. That informal screener is such a wealth of information and it will help you understand where to start in therapy with your students, especially if a standardized assessment was not successful for your students. And that value is 197. What customers are saying, this is from Leilani. She is a parent and she said, I love how you showed us step-by-step step what we should do for the kids. I can see how my child is slowly but surely gaining his confidence in trying to say a word or syllable. I love that. I'm hoping to guide him throughout this journey. Thank you for your help. And Leilani has been such a contributor to our online community. Thank you so much for sharing that. There is also a money back guarantee. Uh, we have a three day money back guarantee. So if you sign up for the course and you get in there and you say, I don't think this is exactly what I had in mind, Rose, you just contact me and you get a money back guarantee. So your total value for all of those things, the five hour ASHA approved course, private Facebook group, group coaching, and all those amazing principles is 2076. But your investment today is just $297. Join us in Start Communicating Today. You get the course, the private Facebook group, those principles that I've been talking about, and group coaching. Your investment is $297. Why you're here. You want to help your students start communicating. You want to feel confident planning therapy for your autistic students. You need to get started now. Take away the overwhelm. Take away the mystery that is planning therapy for your autistic learners. I am here to share with you a step-by-step -step framework so your students are engaged and they are making meaningful progress and they are going to start communicating potentially for the first time. I'll see you in the course. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.